بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم استنف المولكيولر فيسيولوجي احنا وقفنا المرة اللي فاتت عند بوست ترانسفيرنال موديفيكيشن اوف ار ان اي اور وات از نون از ار اي بروسيسنج والنهارده ان شاء الله هنكمل فبنقول ان بوست ترانسكريبشنال موديفيكيشن از بروسيس بايولوجي باي ويتش ان ايوكاريوتيك سيلز ذا برايمري ترانسكريبت ار ان اي از كونفيرتد انتو ماتيور ار ان اي ذيس بروسيس از فايتال فور ذا كوريكت ترانسليشن اوف ذا جينومز Eukaryotes as the human primary RNA transcript that is produced as a result of transcription contains both exons, which are the coding sections of the primary RNA transcript, and introns, which are non-coding sections of the primary transcripts. And so processing is a must to remove the extra nucleotides, to modify bases, to add nucleotides, and for separation of different RNA sequences by the action of specific nucleases. Finally. Uh, the RNA must also be exported from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. أنا تيجي النهاردة نكمل محاضرات المoleculaire physiology. وإحنا وقفنا عند the post transcriptional modification of RNA processing. The post transcriptional modification is a process in cell biology by which in eukaryotic cells primary transcript RNA is converted into mature RNA. This process is vital for the correct translation of the genomes of eukaryotes. as the human primary RNA transcript that is produced as a result of transcription contains both exons which are coding sections of the primary RNA transcript and introns which are non-coding sections of the primary RNA transcript. RNA processing includes removal of extra nucleotides, base modification, addition of nucleotides and separation of different RNA sequences by the action of specific nucleases. Finally, in eukaryotes, RNA must also be exported from the nucleus. Messenger RNA processing. The pre-messenger RNA molecule undergoes three main modifications. These modifications are five prime capping, 3' prime polyadenylation and RNA splicing, which occur in the nucleus of the cell before the RNA is translated. Capping or 5' prime processing of the pre-messenger RNA involves the addition of 7 methyl guanosine to the 5' prime end. In order to achieve this, the terminal 5' prime phosphate requires removal, which is done by the aid of the phosphatase enzyme. The enzyme guanosine transferase then catalyzes the reaction which produces the diphosphate 5' prime end. The diphosphate 5' prime end then attacks the alpha phosphorus atom of the GTP molecule in order to add the guanine residue in a 5' prime 5' prime triphosphate link. The enzyme s adenosyl methionine then methylates the guanine ring at the N7 position. This type of cap with just the uh, methyl guanosine, 7 methyl guanosine, in position is called the cap zero structure. The ribose of the adjacent nucleotide may also be methylated to give the cap one. Methylation of nucleotides downstream of the RNA molecule produce cap two, cap three structures, and so on. In these cases, the methyl groups are added to the two hydroxyl groups of the ribose sugar. The cap protects the five ends of the primary RNA transcript from attack by ribonucleases that have specificity to the three prime five prime phosphodiester bonds. Now we come to the second uh, post-transcriptional modification, which is the cleavage and polyadenylation. The pre-messenger RNA processing at the 3' end of the RNA molecule involves cleavage of its 3' end and then the addition of about 200 adenine residues to form a poly-A tail. The cleavage and adenylation reactions occur if a polyadenylation signal sequence AAUAAA is located near the 3' end of the pre-messenger RNA molecule, which is followed by another sequence, which is usually 5' CA 3'. The second signal is the site of cleavage. A GUH sequence is also usually present further downstream on the pre-messenger RNA molecule. After the synthesis of the sequence elements, two multi-subunit proteins called cleavage and polyadenylation specificity factor and cleavage stimulation factor are transferred from RNA polymerase 2 to the RNA molecule. The two factors bind to the sequence elements. A protein complex is formed which contains additional cleavage factors and the enzyme polyadenylate polymerase. 
This complex keeps the RNA between the polyadenylation sequence and the GU-rich sequence at the cleavage site marked by the CA sequences. Polyadenylene polymerase then adds about 200 adenine units to the duly uh, free prime end of the RNA molecule using ATP as a precursor. As the polyadenine tails is synthesized, it binds multiple copies of poly A binding protein which protects the 3' prime end from ribonuclease digestion. The third post-transcriptional modification is the splicing. RNA splicing is the process by which introns, which are the regions of RNA that do not code for protein, are removed from the pre-messenger RNA, and the remaining exons connected to reform a single continuous molecule. Although most RNA splicing occurs after the complete synthesis and end capping of the pre-messenger RNA, transcripts with many exons can be spliced co-transcriptionally. The splicing reaction is catalyzed by a large protein complex called the spliceosome, assembled from proteins and small nuclear RNA molecules that recognize spliced sites in the pre-messenger RNA sequence. Many pre-messenger RNAs, including those encoding antibodies, can be spliced in multiple ways to produce different mature messenger RNAs that encode different protein sequences, and this is known as alternative splicing and allows production of a large variety of proteins from a limited amount of DNA. This figure shows the post-transcriptional modification, shows the DNA, and shows the transcription, the primary transcript, shows the addition of the 7 methyl guanosine cap at the 5 prime end and shows the addition of the polyadenylate uh, tail, polyadenine tail. This is the cleavage factor, this is the cleavage signal, and this is the polyadenine uh, polymerase, polyadenylate polymerase. This, is, this step is the splicing where the introns are removed and the exons are connected together. This is the mature. Uh, messenger RNA ready to be transported to the cytoplasm and then translated. Now we come to transcription factors. What are transcription factors? They are proteins that bind to specific DNA sequences and control transcription of genetic information from DNA to messenger RNA to st by stimulation or suppression recruitment of RNA polymerase. They bind to either enhancer or promoter regions of DNA adjacent to genes, they regulate causing up or down regulation. What are the functions of transcription factors? Number one, to stabilize or block binding of RNA polymerase to DNA. Number two, to catalyze, catalyze acetylation or deacetylation of histone proteins by stimulating histone acetyl transferase, which acetylates histone proteins thus weaken the association of DNA to histone and makes DNA more accessible and upregulate its transcription. Or to stimulate the histone deacetylase transfer, LAX, which deacetylates histone proteins and strengthen the association of DNA to histone, so make it less accessible and downregulates its transcription. Number three, to regulate, recruit a co-activator or co-repressor proteins to transcription factor DNA complex. What are types of transcription factors? We have many types. Number one, the general transcription factors as TF2A, 2B, 2D, 2E, 2F. Transcription factor encoded by sex determining region Y, gene which play a role in determining gender in humans. Heat shock factors, which upregulates genes necessary for survival at higher temperature. Hypoxia inducible factor, which upregulates genes necessary for cell survival in low oxygen. Many transcription factors are oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes, which regulate the cell cycle, as we will see later on. Now we come to the structure of transcription factors. As we can see, the structure of the transcription factors consists of a DNA binding domain which attaches to the specific sequence which is called response element. Optional signal sensing domain 
which senses external signals and transmits it to the transcription complex. Transactivating domains, which contains binding sites for other proteins such as transcription co-regulators, these binding sites are called activation functions. Now we come to the third process or the third mission, which is translation. Translation is the process of protein biosynthesis. Translation starts by initiation. Initiation requires bringing together a small 40S ribosomal subunit, a messenger RNA, and a transfer RNA. This is followed by the association of the large 60S subunit to form a completed initiation complex on an 80S ribosome. This process requires a complex group of proteins known as initiation factors. What is cap-dependent initiation? For translation to initiate usually involves the interaction of certain key proteins initiation factor 4E with the 5 prime cap of a messenger RNA molecule. It is the rate-limiting step of the cap-dependent initiation. The eukaryotic initiation factor 3 is associated with the small 40S ribosomal subunit and plays a role in keeping the large ribosomal subunit from prematurely binding. It also interacts with the initiation factor 4F complex, which consists of three other initiation factors, A, E, and G. G is a scaffolding protein which directly associates with both 3 and the other two components. 4A is an ATP-dependent RNA helicase which aids the ribosome in resolving certain secondary structures formed by the messenger RNA transcript. And there is another protein associated with the 4F complex called the poly-A binding protein. The poly-A binding protein which binds the poly-A tail of most eukaryotic messenger RNA molecules. This protein has been implicated in playing a role in circularization of the messenger RNA during translation. This pre-initiation complex, the 40S and messenger RNA, accompanied by the initiation factors, move along the messenger RNA chain towards its three prime end, scanning for the start codon. Typically, the start codon is AUG on the messenger RNA, which indicates where the messenger RNA will be encoding for the protein. In eukaryotes, the amino acid encoded by the start codon is methionine. The initiator transfer RNA charged with methionine forms part of the ribosomal complex and thus all proteins start with this amino acid, unless it is given away by protease in subsequent modifications. The methionine charged initiator transfer RNA is brought to the P site of the small ribosomal subunit by the eukaryotic initiation factor 2. It hydrolyzes GTP and signals for the dissociation of several factors from the small ribosomal subunit, which results in the association of the large subunits. The complete ribosome then commences translation elongation, during which the sequence between the start and stop codons is translated from messenger RNA into an amino acid sequence, thus a protein is synthesized. We have another type of initiation which is independent, cap-independent initiation. The cap-independent initiation, the best studied example of the cap-independent mode of translation initiation is the internal ribosome entry site approach. Internal ribosome entry site approach, what differentiates cap-independent translation from cap-dependent translation is that cap-independent translation does not require ribosome to start scanning from the 5' prime end of the messenger RNA cap until the start code. The ribosome can be trafficked to the start site by the internal ribosome entry site transacting factors, bypassing the need to scan from the 5' prime end of the untranslated region of the messenger RNA. This method of translation has been recently discovered and has found to be important in conditions that require the translation of specific messenger RNAs. 
despite cellular stress or the inability to translate most messenger RNAs. Examples include factors responding to apoptosis and stress-induced responses. Then we come to elongation. Elongation is dependent on eukaryotic elongation factors. At the end of the initiation step, the messenger RNA is positioned so that the next codon can be translated during the elongation stage of protein synthesis. The initiator transfer RNA occupies the P site in the ribosome and the A site is ready to receive an amino acid transfer RNA. During the chain elongation, each additional amino acid is added to the nascent polypeptide chain in a three-step microcycle. The steps in this microcycle are number one, positioning the correct amino acid transfer RNA in the A site of the ribosome. Number two, forming the peptide bond. Number three, shifting the messenger RNA by one codon relative to the ribosome. The translational machinery works relatively slowly compared to the enzyme systems that rise DNA replication. Taba. Proteins are synthesized at a rate of only 18 amino acid residues per second, whereas masalan bacterial replosomes synthesize DNA at a rate of 1,000 nucleotides per second. This difference in rate reflects in part the difference between polymerizing four types of nucleotides to make nucleic acids and polymerizing 20 types of amino acids to make proteins. Testing and rejecting incorrect amino acid transfer RNA molecules takes time and slows protein synthesis. The rate of transcription in prokaryotes is approximately 55 nucleotides per second, which corresponds to about 18 codons per second, or the same rate at which the messenger RNA is translated. In bacteria, translation initiation occurs as soon as the 5' prime end of the messenger RNA is synthesized, and translation and transcription are coupled. This tight coupling is not possible in eukaryotes. Why? Because transcription and translation are carried out in separate compartments of the cell, the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Eukaryotic messenger RNA precursors must be processed in the nucleus, the capping, lunali, polyadenylation and spicing, before they are exported to the cytoplasm for translation. Finally, termination. Termination occurs by a chain terminating codon, UAG, UAA or UGA codon in the A site act as a stop codon and does not promote binding of transfer RNA. Instead, eukaryotic release factor binds to ribosome. This figure shows the process of translation. Number one, during initiation, the components of the translation apparatus come together with the messenger RNA, a transfer RNA, carries carrying the first amino acid binds to the start codon AUG. Initiation. Number two, elongation. During elongation, amino acids are brought to the messenger RNA by transfer RNAs and are added one by one to a growing polypeptide chain. Uh -huh. Termination. During termination, a stop codon in the messenger RNA is recognized by a protein release factor and the translational apparatus comes apart, releasing a complete polypeptide. Release factor and releasing the, the complete polypeptide. Before this, we have the association between the units of the ribosomes and the messenger RNA. This is the messenger RNA, this is the start codon, this is the stop codon. Okay. Now we come to display the eukaryotic initiation factors that we have mentioned. The eukaryotic initiation factors are proteins used in eukaryotic translation. The eukaryotic initiation factor is involved, involved include in the formation of initiation complexes with the 5' prime messenger RNA and complexing with methionine transfer RNA, binding messenger RNA factor to the methionine transfer RNA, scanning messenger RNA for the initiator codon, locating the binding site of initiator transfer RNA to the AUG start site, 
and joining of the 60S subunit to create the 80S subunits. We have mentioned the initiation factor uh, 4. The initiation factor 4 include A, B, E, and G. F is often used to refer to the complex of A, E, and G. G is a scaffolding protein that interacts with 3 as well as other members of the 4F complex. 4A is an RNA helicase is important for resolving any secondary structures that the messenger RNA transcript may form. 4E binds the 5 cap of the messenger RNA and the rate limiting step for cap dependent translation. 4D contains two RNA binding domains, one non specific interacts with messenger RNA, while the second specifically binds the 18S portion of the small ribosomal subunit. It acts as an anchor as well as a critical cofactor for A. 1 and 3, 1. 1A and 3 all bind to the ribosome subunit messenger RNA complex. They have been implicated in preventing the large ribosomal subunit from binding the small subunit before it is ready to commence elongation. In mammals, 3 is the largest scaffolding initiation factor made up of 13 subunits. It is roughly 750 kilodalton and it controls the assembly of the 40S ribosomal subunit on messenger RNA that have a 5 prime cap or an iris. Factor 3 uses the factor 4F complex or the iris, which is the internal ribosomal entry site, from viruses to position the messenger RNA strands near the exit site of the 40S ribosome subunit, thus promoting the assembly of the pre-initiation complex. In many cancers, the initiation factor 3 is overexpressed. Number 2, initiation factor 2 is a GTP binding protein responsible for bringing the initiator to the P site uh, of the pre-initiation complex. Uh, it has initiator transfer RNA, of course. The P site of the pre-initiation complex it has specificity for the methionine charged initiator transfer RNA, which is distinct from other methionine charged transfer RNAs specific for elongation of the polypeptide chain. Once it has placed the initiator transfer RNA on the AUG start code in the P site, it hydrolyzes GTP into GDP and dissociates. This hydrolysis also signals for the dissociation of initiation factor 3, 1 and 1A and allows the larger subunit to bind. This signals the beginning of elongation. 2 has three subunits, alpha, beta and uh, gamma subunits. The former is of particular importance for cells which may need to turn off protein synthesis globally. When phosphorylated, it sequesters initiation factor 2B, which is a GEF. Without this GEF, GDP cannot be exchanged for GTP, and the translation is repressed. Initiation factor 2 alpha induced translation repression occurs in reticulocytes when starved for iron. Additionally, protein kinase R phosphorylates initiation factor 2 alpha when double stranded RNA is detected in many multicellular organisms leading to cell death. Again, this part again. E initiation factor 2 has three subunits, alpha, beta, and gamma. The former is of particular importance, which is the alpha, for cells which may need to turn off protein synthesis globally. When phosphorylated, it sequesters initiation factor 2B, which is a guanine exchange factor. Without this factor, GDP cannot be exchanged for GTP, and the translation is repressed. The initiation factor 2 alpha induced the translation repression occurs in reticulocytes when starved for iron. Okay. Additionally, protein kinase R phosphorylates initiation factor 2 alpha when double stranded RNA is detected in many multicellular organisms leading to cell death. This is the function of the initiation factor.
Association factor 5 and 5b, they are a GTPase activating protein, which helps the large ribosomal subunits associate with the small subunits. It is required for GTP hydrolysis by the initiation uh, factor 2. Initiation factor 5b is a GTPase and is involved in the assembly of the full ribosome, which requires GTP hydrolysis. This figure shows the association of the eukaryotic initiation factors in the process of translation. The initiation factor 4, F complex, initiation factor 4, A, the 3, 5, 2, this is the 40 ribosome subunit. This is the cap of the messenger RNA. Direction scanning for the start site. This is the 60 ribosome subunit. We will stop here. Thank you very much.